Okay, you had a very special uh, upbringing in, in Graceland. You had a bed made of mink fur. You had special rings made for you at the age of four. You had a golf cart. You were spoiled like mad. Mm. How would you describe this little girl? I think confused. I don't think that I looked at it as being spoiled. I think that I looked at it as my father loved me and didn't get to spend a lot of time with me. And when he did, he wanted to go out of his way to do whatever he needed to do to make me, you know, seemingly happy. Um, I had a very large dichotomy, though. You know, that that was part of my life. But then I would go home and live in a small apartment with my mother. And, and yeah, in Los Angeles. Because yeah. when they divorced, when you were four, your mom moved to Los Angeles. And right. You spent quite a lot of time in Graceland still with your dad. Yes, but I, it was too... It was just a dichotomy, you know, uh, going from that to a, a very regimented, scheduled, normal life with an apartment with my mom, two-bedroom apartment, to that, you know, it was back and forth. So it wasn't just one, that was all that was there. And my mother was very level-headed and very set on me being level-headed, so she'd have to sort of undo whatever was done if I went to Graceland and spent two weeks being, you know, crazy tyrant, you know, she'd have to come and, <laughs> and sort of guide me back in the right direction. Who ruled Graceland? Um, who, who was the dictator? Well, my father, but if he was sleeping, and I would. <laughs> <laughs> somebody, somebody told me you were, you, you were very good at, uh, you found a very smart way of telling people that if you don't do what yeah. I say, I'm going to tell my dad and he's going to fire you. <laughs> they hear these stories a lot when I was a kid. I, I, there's one that my, um, uh, one of the cooks just recently told me. She said, you came in the kitchen one day and you said, I want. I wanted. She made a chocolate cake, and she said, and I wanted to eat it. She said, you can't wait. And your father said, no, you're going to have dinner. And I said, you're fired. Get out. This is my house. <laughs> and she, and I was, you know, that was that was an element. It was a phase. It didn't last, you know, but I did go through it. Because I think you had a pretty rough time. I, I um, your your mom has told that uh, a story about when. It, she wanted you for a photo together with the, your the mom and dad, and you were crying, you didn't want to leave your nurse. And then she realized that you had been so much with your nurse, mm. so, I mean, you weren't even at ease uh, being with her. Right. So you must have been very lonely. I was, yeah. She was, uh, I remember her very well, sweet uh, Japanese lady, and I was very attached. I was very heartbroken she, when she got rid of her, I couldn't believe it. But they were very busy then, and um, yeah, I was. I mean, most of the time I would be in my room listening to music, uh, not really wanting to play with friends. Music was everything. I had a little 45 and records, and I'd just listen, 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 you know. And how did you perceive all this fame thing and fans and people trying to climb over the fence? And it's funny because I just adapted early and didn't have any kind of, uh, you know, um, didn't know any different. When, when I see pictures of you from, from when you were growing up, you don't look very happy. Mm. Why? I don't know. I was sort of a, you know, um, perp I, I don't know. I, I was very deep as a kid. I had a lot of questions about life. Exposed to death very early. Um, not really a kid that was interested in being uh, materialistic or celebrity or super, you know, I didn't have, I was very sort of uh, spiritual at a young age, wanting to know deep, dark questions about life very early on. Mm -hmm. Didn't have them answered yet, so it's sort of purposeless, not quite understanding how things worked. Um, alone a lot, music was a huge part of my life, so that's what would get me through things. And you saw your father slowly go towards <coughs> death, becoming uh, more and more sick. Mm -hmm. How did you perceive this as a little child? I don't know. I just knew. So you have a 14-year-old daughter, and when, you're, when you, were, you were 14, you had already been going on drugs for like a year or so. No, I started, what, I started with drugs 14, 15. Okay. Yeah. But you tell your daughter about this? Yeah, she knows. Yeah. And what does she say? What did you take? What, you, you know, mm -hmm. what, what did that do and why? And I'd explain, you know, this was like a phase that I went through. And mm -hmm. It's not something that I wanted to do, obviously, but I, I also know that people were telling me don't do it, and you do it, and I tried to explain that, you know, yeah. I did it amongst others, and I'm, I was fortunate, and other celebrity kids particularly were doing it, that I knew, and I, I came out of it. That's not always going to happen, you know. Do a lot of those people are dead now. I'm going to quote uh, just a few sentences from different songs on the album. I seem so grim, 
Worms are crawling on me. I'm just a son of a bitch. It's definitely my fault. I've hurt you again. I'm your disease. I was wrong. I'm so mean. I broke up my family. The guilt is never gone. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, How are you? <laughs> <laughs> this is you. Uh, this is, you're, you're pulling out, like, you know, yeah, this but is, yeah. your songs. Yes. <laughs> um, I pull from, uh, songwriting is cathartic, therapeutic for me, so I pull from pain. I respond to music where I, someone's really sort of purging emotionally. So I do, and I've been writing since I was 23, sort of to get myself through things. And um, I, I can say that I, I, go, I go for it when I'm writing, you know, I definitely go there. But I mean, is uh, this, this picture you seem to have of yourself, is this... <coughs> Uh, is this uh, the way you feel about yourself? Each song is from a different part of my life, so they represent something I went through or felt, and I'm sure that you know at the time I probably felt that way. That doesn't in any way signify my normal state of mind or my normal well-being. You, you were kind of quiet about yourself earlier right. on, but still people had this image of you. Mm. What, what, what image was that? Oh, the image. This is a tabloid, sensationalistic, you know, sort of image kind of mm -hmm. funneled on its own out of control because I would never say anything. So for years, you know, it's tabloid, 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 who I was married to, what I've done, or, you know, silliness, basically. But it, you know, stacked up over 30 years. It, it was a lot. So when I put the record out, it's like I have to combat all of that in one shot. So it was a little overwhelming on that front. You, you talked about your life as a fishbowl life. Mm. Can you explain what that is? Um, you know, it's just some everyone can see from a 360 degree view of whatever's going on around you in your life. So um, I don't necessarily think it's always been that um, because I've been able to keep away and sort of move. You know, I haven't really been out there till now. Um, so other than people being aware of my, you know, personal mishaps, uh, it's been, you know, relatively quiet. <coughs> Are you got married pre pretty young. How is it for a famous woman to marry a regular guy? Um, that's been the biggest dilemma, I think, and that's kind of been what's what's been uh, being displayed, I guess you could say. Is, is that's always difficult because they can be very talented, beautiful s people, spirits, and then you know get with me and turn into get overwhelmed by the fact that I have the money or the fame or the the celebrity or, or and they just have they lose their identity and and um, their ego goes down and there's resentment, that's a problem. So then I go to the extreme opposite trying to figure out, okay, you know, this person's more famous or as me, and then that has its drawbacks. So it's been, you know, it's not easy either way. There's mm. gotta be something in the middle, you know. But do you think it's harder for a famous woman to marry a regular guy than the opposite? Yes, Why? absolutely. Because it's not natural. It's not the way things have been set up, you know. So how are things been set up? Men tend to want to be the provider. And instinctively and um, understandably so so it's a little difficult and and being with a woman who is that you know but the daughter of the biggest rock icon ever marries the biggest pop icon now living was that a coincidence um, I felt like it was the right I should do that because it seemed more maybe that's what I should be doing instead of um, taking these dear souls and making them feel like they're nothing when they're, when they're a lot, you know? When they're very talented on their own. I was tired of doing that and raking them over the coals. Not, not, not me, but just the whole situation, you know? Mm -hmm. Of them being used to get to me or everything being about me. So it, it, that's not fun for a man. So then you thought when you met the pop icon Michael Jackson, how did you think when you fell in love with him? I was, he's very different than he was, you know, he presents himself to be in public. Um, I think we had different lives, different circumstances, both of us, and sort of connected based on that fact. Um, and it kind of went from there. <coughs> there was a click, we, we started talking and immediately related to one another and it just kind of went from there because, you know, raised differently and had different circumstances presented to us in life. So. There was a connection based on that, and uh, didn't necessarily think it was going to go romantic, but it did. Um, and um, you know, uh, seemingly all fine, and um, 
real and then you know were people questioning your relationship with him fr from start I mean your friends and your mom and yeah people weren't really into that one I mean they were trying to you know say certain things about it but I, I you know I needed to figure it out on my own <coughs> because he was writing this sex abuse scandal yes. and things so what yeah. did people th say to you um, mostly my mom was just like you know look at the timing of this and don't be stupid and but how did you, I mean, did it have anything to do, I want you to explain, <laughs> because for me, when I read that article, I, I suddenly understood w the way you'd been reasoning, so I want you to tell me. How did you, how did you reason about, I mean, you'd been married to a regular guy, it didn't work. Mm. You meet Michael Jackson, you fall in love, mm. so how do you think about this? So in that way, I think, you know, I, I can be in a situation where someone's more famous than I or as famous or a huge icon and then I can sort of have my position as a female. I can be next to the man and I can feel more comfortable that way. I wasn't seeking publicity myself. Mm -hmm. I was kind of looking to feel like I can support somebody else that I admired. Did you speak to Michael about this? No. I mean, I, I kind of just adapted to taking care of him and, you know, being a wife, sort of trying to do that, you know. And did you enjoy that? I did, for a while, yeah. <laughs> and then what happened? Um, I don't think it was at all appreciated and it sort of started to just dwindle out of control and it went to hell in a handbasket basically, yeah. But mm. you know, he, we both, I'm not going to point fingers and all that, but um, uh, it was just didn't work. Do you regret it? Um, it sort of stigmatized me you know, uh, without my knowing about it. So I regret that, you know, immediately it's that whole, what is it with you, you know, what was that In Michael Jackson? In what way did it stigmatize you? It's just because I'm always associated with that, you know, everything's about that. You were married to Michael Jackson, that's like the biggest, you know. And it turned me into a freak. So, um, you divorced? Yeah. <laughs> and then what happened? I was quiet for about a year and I fell apart physically for a while and then I sort you of... You fell apart physically? Yeah, I just had a lot of things happen physically. Um, you, you were sick? Mm, I mean, you know, just my body was breaking down. <coughs> so sounds, sounds very s serious. Yeah, it was, it was like that for a couple years and then I... So it was really a very, very heavy thing for you, this relationship? Yeah, it was very was stressful. And it sort of had an after effect. You know, mm -hmm. I got out and then four days later started having chronic panic attacks and just my body just freaked out on me and I, you know. Did so you go through a therapist? No. I'm a Scientologist, so. Uh-huh. But Did I that. Uh, And uh, when you're a Scientologist, you don't do a therapy? There's a form of counseling, but it's not the same as, you know, uh, labeling or um, stigmatizing one or drugging someone. It's very mm -hmm. different. So, so how could Scientology help you in this uh, crisis after the relation with Michael Jackson? You know, it was a long process, but it happened. You know, it was long, sweeping me, mopping me up off the floor. You know, I had to basically, I had made a lot of progress prior to that, and I had to do it all again, basically, is what happened. So but what do you do? I don't know actually what you do. Well, there's two sides of it. There's a studying side, where you just read and you're studying, and um, it's sort of a science of life, and encyclopedia of life, and explains a lot. And um, so it explains it to the point where it's actually working, not, you know, you have to believe in this and it's this or that. So there's either the study section part of it or there's a, a counseling thing that you do. It's, it's more of a, just based on the communication and somebody sort of guiding you to self-realize things, not, not, you know, stigmatize you or label you and evaluate you, you know. And how does it work for you? It helped me understand myself, my mind, other people's minds, sanity, insanity, uh, the dark black cloud that seems to be looming over everybody, whatever you want to call that, you know, psychoanalysis or likes to call it the subconscious, whatever it is, it's existing, it's there. And Scientology answered that for me very well. So um, what that is, what it means, what it entails, and how do you get so that it doesn't control you and what do you do and things like that. And it, does it cost a lot of money to be part of that? You know, there's a course that can cost 50 bucks, 100 mm -hmm. bucks. It depends on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah. But then you were fine anyway, and you fell in love again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nick showed up at the right time, and that happened. And Nick, that's Nicolas Cage, Nicolas the actor. Cage. 
And how would you describe the relation you had to him? Um, we had similar backgrounds, similar histories in terms of our families being, you know, what they were, and um, immediate connection, kindred spirits, rebellious, wild, um, you know, just different than other people, and I think we just got connected on that front. So how is he as a guy? How is he? Mm -hmm. He's great. Yeah. We're still friends. Everything's mm -hmm. good. So you got married? Mm-hmm. But? Well, you know, we were together two years before we got married, mm -hmm. so it was kind of one of those things where um, if you, we already had a certain pattern going. You know, it was a bit wild and stormy. So hoping marriage would, you know, make that more stable, make each other feel more secure, and um, it didn't, you know, it either, when you get married based on something like that, it's either going to embellish the problem or it's going to handle it. So in this case, it amplified it. And, you know, we were two pirates, basically. And one pirate marries another and they'll sink the ship. So that's what happened. But before they sink the ship, they throw the ring. I didn't throw the ring. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. But who threw the ring? Somebody. Somebody one, threw You it. and Nicholas Cage <laughs> were on this boat. You had this ex Expensive engagement ring was like more than sixty-five thousand dollars, right? And it fell down in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Somebody threw it. Who mm. did it? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Somebody on the boat. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not getting into that. <laughs> that specifically, it just it wasn't me. I was getting the rap for it. <laughs> and it I just remember watching it fly, going, <laughs> and then I was, you know, watched it hit the water and go down. And it was 150 feet down, so. Yeah. Did anybody die? Yes. Yes. It was very stressful. Only one guy was crazy enough to go down that far. It's, you know, a big production to go down that far and look for something at the bottom of the ocean. So, so where was it? It was in Catalina. Mm -hmm. Would you say, I mean, do you see, I mean, I think a lot of people have, have had a lot of stormy relations. Do you think that you are, are a worse than others or is it just that you have all the spotlights on you i th i think that i've i don't know i have spotlights on me they weren't particularly that you know out of control but it looks like that when you look at just that part of my life yeah um and the media loves i don't know how many times i've i've been reading uh Lisa Marie's 108 days long marriage with nicholas cage oh, i love the 108 days thing yeah not three months, but 108 so next days. So the <laughs> next time you're going to get married, they're going to count. 58 days. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody told me yesterday, you should get a revolving door in your house <laughs> and make it a lot easier. <laughs> so, but how does it affect you, this fishbowl thing that, that, that the media are, are watching everything you do and, and uh, sometimes ridiculing you and sometimes accusing you of things you haven't done? Um, I hate it, you know. Honestly, I don't like it, but it's actually... But it's does it actually affect your relations mm -hmm. to other people? You know, it, it, it can, but I think uh, it can if you take it too seriously. Yeah. Because, you know, the, the thing that affects me is when, when I'm with someone and they try to make it look like that's this, you know. She's with Nick because of you know, he's obsessed with her dad or something. It's not, there, there can't possibly be a real connection. It's about that. Or there's some weird thing they try to put with my dad with everyone, and then they, they, they can make it into whatever they want, and that's very frustrating. This man was, you know, multi-talented, done 50 movies, won an Academy Award. I don't know what, and they had to s somehow discredit it and him by putting him there, you know? Like, he's just an obsessed freak, and that's why he's with her. Uh, it, that was just horrendous. And it affected him, too. It affected both of us, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was like, when I do this promotion, I'm going to set it straight because it's driving me crazy. I can't believe they actually do this with you. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking I'm being with you, and that's not going to happen. But no, there's got to be that because it was the, the movies or the, you know, things that he did before. So, yeah. Which were coincidental, you know? Mm -hmm. <sighs> but you also described yourselves as two, how, what was it? Two 12-year-olds in a sand. Yeah, sandbox. <laughs> <laughs> but I find that pretty mature, you know, because you don't get very much more mature, I think, than 12, maybe 14, <laughs> when, you, when you're 50, that is. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I just used to say to him, when you turn 13, let me know, we'll yeah. and then we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> But 
But you're a businesswoman also, are you? Yes. You're, you're the manager of the Elvis Presley Enterprise, which is a big industry. It's, I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars mm. every year. Mm -hmm. So how is that, being a, a businesswoman? Um, I just recently became the chairman of the board, you know, in the last five years. But it, it, it's kind of been, I've been sort of being bred to, to run it since I was 17, knowing that I had a responsibility there. So it's, it's um, something that I got used to very early in life. My mom sort of started getting me ready for that early. There's a, there's a pretty strange uh, business, a, a business based on your, your father and his fame. Yeah, the, the idea that in the beginning never, never felt right to me because it was my home, my home. <laughs> but it is your, yeah, it was at, your home. But at the same time, you know, she took it and did what she did and, and you couldn't, you know, make it. She, she took it, you mean your mom? Yeah, I mean, my mother took it and turned it around. It was nothing, you know. Uh, it wasn't gonna provide for me or mm. keep everybody afloat or do anything. So she had to do what she needed to do and I understand that. So I respect that, and it's it's working, and it makes a lot of people happy, and um, to see it and be a part of it, and uh, yeah, it's it's not somewhere that I plan to live, uh, any you know. So it's it seems to be fine now. Mm -hmm. So thank you very very much. Thank you. Very nice talking to you. You too. Really very nice. You too.